everyone, it's Steve Elkin Napier. Welcome to the Circle of Brilliance. Today we're going to continue our discussion about parenting on the change grid. So we're on the change grid. Do you need to be uh, to be the best parent, whatever that means? And uh, depending on what state your child is in, where they're landing on the change grid, what do you need to employ in order to move them to wherever it is you think is a better location on the change grid? So we got lots of application stuff that's going to happen around the uh, topic of change grid maneuvers. Um, but we're going to see if we can apply it to being a, a parent. So um, on the screen right now, you see a layer of the change grid we don't often talk about, but I thought this could be an interesting one to look at uh, specifically regarding parenting. So uh, how many of you remember this layer from your training in uh, comparative human typological analysis? Yes, no? Oh, I don't I remember this layer, I the... love the layer. Good, all right. So. I'll tell you where the layer, the layer comes in. So we got to go back to the uh, four types, upgrade, outgrid, downgrid, and ingrid. Well, uh, there's several models of human behavior who have added a fifth to this set of four. And that fifth is uh, saying like, oh, well, there's one right in the middle too. You might be a balance of, the, of all of these. And then there's uh, people who say, oh no, there's really eight types. And the eight type says they still have up, out, down, and in, but they have the blend of up and out, and the blend of out and down, and the blend of down and in, and the blend of in and up. So those are kind of like just a stopping somewhere, like a Kodak moment. They've just made it a little bit wider to <laughs> understand what happens during this transition between upgrade and outgrade, downgrade and ingrid. There were a great many models that did propose eight different types. And so when we decided to put together our overlay, we decided to use one of the identifiers. Let me click over there. One of the identifiers from each of eight different models that had eight types. So there is no model that has energy influencer, leader, advocator, uh, but there is a model that has advocator in different words for all of these. And one that says energizer, but has different words for all of these. So um, we just wanted to choose a word that we thought was really most behavioral and uh, then see how it could be. So this layer, if you were using the online system and wanted to swap out the background image, this I believe would be the one that says roles. Not sure, we'd have to go online to do that, but uh, what role are you playing? when you're doing whatever it is, wherever you happen to fall in the change grid. And so um, let's say that you've got um, a situation where you're very far upgrade. Again, we could go back to the composite and you could see that you're up in stress, maybe even the upgrade danger zone, uh, perceived low ability, relatively high, extremely high challenge. So here you are. Well, one of the models says, oh, well, that makes you the energizer. Now in DISC, they'd say, oh, no, that makes you the I type. And it's like, hmm, well, there's a lot more than influence that goes on when you're here on the change grid. So you're the energizer. You could also be the energized uh, there as well, if whatever's going on in the environment or whatever's moving you that far upgrade. Uh, it might be what's energizing you, in which case you're the energizer. But as far as what role you play when you're in that, that section of the change grid, you have an energizing effect on other people um, and on your own thoughts and responses. So we could go a lot deeper into that, but anyone have any questions, comments about energizer? Well, well team, not to... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Tim. No, I was just going to say, uh, not so much on the energizer, but but to simply say that I really like and find value in this particular layer. Oh, excellent. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, particularly as it relates to how one perceives themselves, their role in the organization and how the organization sees them. Um, this, this became evident in a coaching session with a gentleman in career transition. And one of the challenges for him is he had a supervisory role, but he could not relinquish uh, his, his love, his interest in, in, in um, serving the customer. 
And so his leadership said to him, you need to make sure, you need to let us know what role you want to play. Do you want to be the leader of the team or do you want to be a team member? Mm -hmm. uh, mm. And, and so that really took us into some interesting conversation, but I shared uh, this piece with him and it really helped him understand where he was uh, in the large scheme of things. So this is a really useful layer of the tool. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and I think that it very much connects. Some of you might have a background in transactional analysis. Um, and so some of these labels are going to very much resonate with the different role you can serve in those kinds of transactions. There are a couple of other roles that get talked about in transactional analysis. And in fact, on an upcoming call, I wanted to share with you guys something that maybe you guys have heard me talk about before, but the transactional awareness game, um, a literal game. And um, it uses a diagram that's about three feet by three feet. Um, and that diagram is probably the most comprehensive, um, let me say, compilation of all these different models and labels and words you could be using, but it's all presented as a giant circle. So I know that means nothing and it's very curious. Um, about, so I'll show it to you when the time comes, but this is a very junior version of that. So rather than going all the way around this diagram for the transactional awareness game, um, you could just say, well, let's just reduce all of its detail, all of its subtleties, all of its nuances to these eight basic modes that we go into when it comes to being uh, involved in living. So sometimes what we need to be is the energizer. That's the role that we're serving. And we might be serving it for ourselves, or you might be serving it um, as, as a um, an oppor uh, opportunity to, to support other people, but that's it. We're just being energizing. Now, do you guys believe that energize should go all the way to the extreme top? Is someone in the upgrade danger zone energize an energizer? Well, I was going to say, it, it, from my perspective, if you're excited about something and you you know you're going to learn to overcome that perceived challenge, mm -hmm. you'd be energized. But if you're terrified of it, you could be an instigator. Right. Mm. And so that's why I'm thinking, like, if you're that far upgrade, you might be energized but uh, by whatever, I mean, something's threatening my life. I promise you my level of energy is going to be at an all-time high. So something energized me. Sadly, it was that which threatened my life. But nevertheless, um, I would say I'm more energized in the danger zone than I'm, than I'm energizing other people. Um, and this is going to become important because we're going to talk about where do these descriptors need to have a limit placed as we work our way around them. Okay, anyway, that's an energizer. Now, if you go out grid, that's the leader type. That should be no surprise. That's the driv that's the driver type. So no surprise. All the things you know about a driver type would also be about a leader. Um, so that word may apply. Um, but again, it can be a problem if you're too far out grid. And down grid, where we talk about the analytical energy, they've got the thinker. So, um, yeah, and other models might have called it the analyzer or whatever. You can come up with all sorts of synonyms that may, uh, may land there. But nevertheless, this is a person who is more about the world of what's going on in their mind. And then on the very far in-grid side. Hey, T. Yep. Hey, quick question. So is sure. it like similar to Energizer, the more upgrid you go the, with the thinker, the more downgrid you go, the deeper in apathy, are you really even thinking at that time? Because, you know, you, you don't even care about it. Right. But that could be more than as we move further and further downgrid, our consciousness is slipping or I'm li literally physical consciousness is slip is slipping. And um, I also think that the whole evaluative kind of property moves to something more instinctual when you're too far down grid. And maybe that's not even fair. Maybe what's really fair is there's a certain level of activity that comes from, uh, that happens during laziness. Um, you know, you're still doing whatever, you know, you're doing when you're lazy. Um, so I think there's that. So are they still thinking? If they are, I think it's gotta be at some very autonomic kind of level 
or some very instinctual level. I don't think they're giving any kind of valuable conscious thought to much if they're in the danger zone. Does that match what you were thinking? Yeah, that explanation does. It does help. Yeah. 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 So, um, and then again, you know, on the end grid side of thing, you got the follower type. Well, I think being a follower has to involve a certain level of willingness to do something. And I don't know that that's going to be the case if I'm extremely far in grid. So I'm saying all that just to say, I've got no argument with these labels. My question is how far do they reach? Now, if you take the energizer and blend them with a leader in equal proportions, well, what does an energized leader do? Or what does a leading energizer do? Well, that's where this word influencer came from. Today. So they have some place they want to go and they got a lot of energy. So they're trying to influence other people to go along that way. So the influencer, the recruiter, that sort of thing. Now, the half leader and half thinker now think what's going on. Half of my energy is out grid and half of it is down grid. What's the in-between place? Well, think about what's happening. The thinker is operating in their head and the leader is out there physically doing things. This is the half in my head, half doing things kind of role. And that's where the advocator became a good descriptor because these are the people, again, we put in the levels of tension. This is where power apathy would be. So that's where people want to, by nature, delegate kinds of things. And so advocating often takes the form of, hey, I have this thought or I have this insight, this understanding, this awareness. And, and I think that it really has sufficient merit that somebody else someday should grab the bull by the horns and do something with it. Can you feel that an, an advocator is not out there doing the work? The advocator is more about supporting others who want to do the work by giving them the evidence or whatever to speak or advocate on their behalf. So that could be uh, certainly part of what's going on. But they could also be the ones who are just talking the big game, solving the world's problems, uh, using nothing but their words. Uh, and so very little may ever uh, come from that. So I'm kind of curious to know what you guys think about this whole advocator way of doing things. So what's its best expression and worst expression? Thoughts about that, anyone? This makes sense to me, T. Um, I, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I plugged in late, so I'm not quite sure where this came. I can't remember which yeah, assessment it, this came from. It came from, yeah, from ours, but this is a different label taken from each of eight different eight type personality profiles. Oh, oh, okay, okay. No, no, I think it, I think this makes a lot of sense, and and yeah. and I and I and I think the labels work, and I and I think in response to your earlier question, where does this end? I think it ends at the danger zones. I, I, since you've brought that up, let me jump to the, uh, where's balance? Here it is, next one. I think it's got the, you know, these are all uh, relatively positive words. I can't think of any reason why I would frame these words as being negative when you're in their genuine centered definition. Um, I'm just thinking, well, that could be all really good stuff, but that's, where people are inside of the red circle. Maybe uh, some of them are even inside of the green circle more so. But we've always said that what happens between the green circle and the red circle is that this is where life is lived. And so as I'm out there living life, maybe it's these different roles I'm moving myself into as I'm out there trying to do whatever it is the situation at hand um, needs done. That, that makes sense to me. That's what I was thinking when you were talking about them, that, that the, you know, that the danger zones just don't apply when you're using these words. No. Um, yeah. Yeah. So as long as we kind of do that, I go like, okay, I can see all these things. Now, I think it's interesting. You know, we never talk about the in-grid side of the change of rate. <laughs> so there's a lot of good stuff that happens uh, leaning that direction. If I'm half of the analytical energy and I'm half of the amiable energy, um, and I'm, you know, being very thoughtful, and I'm also a bit of a follower. Well, this is where the administrator comes along. An administrator tends to be someone who takes care of details. Um, 
none of it is particularly difficult, that stuff would be uh, handed off to an advocate or a leader, or an influencer or something like that. But there are systems and processes in place. There's right ways of doing things. And um, this is the energy that best does that. They view themselves as having moderate ability and the challenge is being rather low because these things we would at least hope have been somewhat structured and formalized. They just really need to be um, used. Uh, when uh, when time goes on, so that's the administrator, and I think that's it. Yep, go right ahead. A question, just to just to go back for a moment. Um, in my mind, I'm still stuck at advocate. Still thinking about advocator because it falls in the area where the threshold of um, that was just in my delegation. head. Uh, mm -hmm. Delegation. So when you're thinking about wanting to pass off as an advocator, yep, wouldn't an advocator want to more own? the topic or the situation? Well, I think they always want to be the one that's going to uh, try to run the show. You know, they are interested in fame and fortune. They're just not interested in work. Mm -hmm. So to really do the things that the advocator is um, advocating, <laughs> um, you need someone who's going to be a bit further upgrade, more that leader energy is going to go out there and be the doer. Again, I think advocators, even when I think about what an advocator does, is they are speaking on behalf of someone else, or they are speaking on behalf of some um, sort of way of operating, you know, they're, they're advocating for better health care, they're advocating for so and so to be put into whatever position it happens to be. So usually they're doing something on behalf of a cause or on behalf of other people. That doesn't mean they're really doing the work as much as they're just promoting the work or standing behind it. Do you guys feel that energy is, and do you feel it as being different than the doing part? Any thoughts? About yes, that? yes, I definitely do. I think that's that's very accurate. I mean, yeah, I I mean under I've seen myself play both roles and I understand the difference, yeah. Yeah, in fact, I'm more than happy to advocate for stuff, but people do not make me do the work, okay? So, I mean, you know, uh, and I think anyone who's really active in any kind of community um, or cause can find themselves very easily, sometimes even unknowingly getting sucked into doing some sort of project all because they said, oh, that could be a good idea. In fact, Linda, is Linda on the call? Yeah, yeah, I'm here and I'm just about to say, are you talking about me? No, I, you know, well, you know, as I finished what I was saying, I thought, oh my God, you just went through this. So share with everybody what your, what your uh, situation. Well, I, I've been working on healthcare um, for six years, seven years, and very passionate influencer, energizer, um, leader. And can you see energizer, influencer, leader. And now I'm like, I don't want to call it burned out, but if, if going down grid is burned out, I just want somebody else to do it. Oh, I'll help yeah. now. I've got the knowledge. I'll pass it on to somebody else that's the energizer, influencer. But I'm just... Um, yeah. I'm kind of done, even though it's still really important. Yeah. I just don't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Right, because mm -hmm. the pursuit of mastery is a very different experience than the achievement of mastery. Mm -hmm. That's right. You, right. Linda is about as fluent in the whole world of international health care policy as anybody is going to get. So um, she definitely knows her stuff, but we know what happens as you move further and further down grid. Um, you know, you start to not so much lose interest in it as much as something that's got more energy around it is competing more powerfully against that, which True. is so simple yeah. to you. Right. Um, but Linda, does that include what you, Linda and her colleague that did this big presentation somehow got sucked into doing another kind of a presentation. And yeah. those of you yeah. who are presenters, it has a hundred plus slides in the PowerPoint deck. Mm. Well, we were, we were, uh, co-chairs for the healthcare community doing all these amazing educational trainings all over the valley and um carol got this brilliant idea she, because we always get excited about stuff and suggested 
<laughs> that the league yes, really for all these new people they should know about all the cool things how women got the vote our history what our league personally has done which is over the top amazing but these new people don't know this so we said yeah we should have a program and they said okay do it Yep. And so we're all of a sudden going, and no, 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 no. <laughs> yep, I think everyone's been there. You, you know, you, all because you opened your mouth and made a suggestion. That's the advocator kind of uh, kind of situation. So lots of stuff can happen there. Yeah, Some of that can be very positive. All the time. Yeah. I get that all the time with the storytelling group. And I said, so who's taking charge of this? Right. Who's got the who's got the D? Who's got the decision? Yeah, yeah taking it on i will support it but i will not do it right you got to draw the line sometimes just so you have your own energy around it and by the way if you keep doing the same thing you know do serve that role over and over and over you're also depriving somebody else of a developmental experience mm. so you got your needs met out of your involvement with it so fine move on to whatever's next for you and let somebody else take over what you've been doing everyone everybody grows everybody grows yeah. Okay. Uh, the only way I'm talked about is this helper kind of thing. And so uh, I want to make sure you guys know the difference between a helper and a follower, and maybe even a helper and an administrator, because administrators are certainly helpful. But administrators have a much stronger level of ability to do specific sorts of things where a helper shows up and because they've got a lot of energy around it and they've got this follower kind of role that they're happy to be in, they don't, they don't, they don't just want to follow in terms of um, verbal support or you know, psychic support or whatever. They actually want to go out there and help. And so they'll take on a little bit more of a challenge. And usually it's that energizer who's running the show at the uh, community garden or, you know, big cleanup project or whatever the helper kind of thing happens to, uh, to actually be. And um, I'm reminded, uh, my favorite show was always Extreme Makeover Home Edition. And when Lynn and I were living in Charlotte, we had the opportunity to serve on the build team for an Extreme Makeover Home Edition episode. And um, uh, all because the person who was doing the actual construction job lived across the street from us and found out while the gals were on a neighborhood walk that I'm uh, hopelessly devoted to this show. And uh, so anyway, um, we, got, we got there, we got to do the whole thing. Well, I don't know what they want me to do. So, but I know it can't be all that challenging. I'm not a tradesperson. They're not stupid. And so it can't be all that challenging. So I was here ready to always a follower, always supportive of what they were doing and ended up moving up to a helper. And so I basically hosted the VIP tent, which was right across from the house. And I, I was actually able to watch how quickly one of these houses get built and how they make that all happen. So it was kind of great. And Linda, what were you doing? What did, what was your build team doing? I think I was putting together something. I can't remember. I just remember barriers? I was- Barriers? Was it crowd barriers or no, something? No, no, no. We were actually constructing, like maybe it was stuff that went inside the house, but we had directions and we had to oh, assemble. Yeah, yeah. We were assembling things. All right. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Well, there you go. Anywho, um, so the, the, the helper wants to be a little bit more active. They have more productive tension about what's going on. They are more energized. An administrator can be very routine, doing things on autopilot. Habit is a big, fa uh, big uh, um, asset to administrative energy. Um, so okay, so- Can I ask a question? Sure, go ahead. So uh, if I'm an advocator, you know, as I've moved down grid, but I really now feel like um, I can't remember who just said, um, I'll advocate for it, but I won't do it. Right. That was Shags. Yeah. Right. And that's it. You guys have to have boundaries. That's the problem with an advocator. Uh, an advocator gets sucked into things unknowingly because look, who's influencing them? A, a good leader can pull them into, oh, you know, I can, you know, when we talk about outgrade maneuvers, one of them is that leaders believe in you before you believe in yourself. And so they can easily pull you into stuff unless you've got a really strong barrier to put in place there. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, Boris, what were you about to say? Um, 
Yeah, I wasn't sure if my audio was working. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I, I know that when you put labels on these roles, there's you know certainly a good amount of nuance to to the different labels. Yeah. Um, and we're up against a little bit of a challenge with our team internally. We were doing some uh, profiles. Uh, you're probably familiar with Bassiter as oh, yeah. one of them, and, and trying to figure out why we have a tendency to uh, attract a certain type of an individual uh, to a role and then um, it doesn't work out. And we've had a couple of these individuals, what Bassetter calls these people implementers. And yep. when, when I interpreted implementer and, and everything that came along with the materials, I said to myself, this is a person that can get the job done, right? right? You, you hand it off to them and you expect that they're gonna get it done. And in all the cases so far, they didn't get anything done. In fact, right. These individuals were really looking for somebody to give them a very specific task, um, and then they were willing to engage. But if they were given a project and they had to manage the project and think it through, and they couldn't do it, it wasn't work. It didn't right. work. It was like oil and water, and they they would quit. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so that's the struggle we're facing internally. And I'm just wondering, like, how these labels might be helpful um in understanding we're attracting the wrong person or yeah. we're we're presuming that they can do something that they're not really interested in doing right because sooner or later we need people to actually do the work to implement whatever the big strategy decision whatever mm -hmm. someone has to follow through and do the work mm -hmm. um when it comes to Bastor, i would say that that whole concept is what follows Bassiter. so the change grid follows the Bassiter profile or the Bassiter experience that you mm -hmm. might have gone through because see the people who are actually going to follow through and do the work are the helper the follower the administrator uh perhaps to a certain degree the energizer because there needs to be a team um, you know, not so much leader, I don't want to use that word, but you know, someone's got to get people focused. So if I said to you that if you drew a vertical line straight down the top uh, uh, over the change grid, um, uh, we would have this whole out grid hemisphere and this whole in grid sort of hemisphere. You guys still there? Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. something just flashed on my screen. I had no idea what's happening. Uh, anyway, so on the Ingrid side of things, you tend to be more of the follower kind of way of operating. And if you're on the outgrid side of things, or you're more of the leader kind of things, these are people over here that are making things happen, seeing what the future could hold, even mapping out things conceptually and uh, making decisions and all that sort of stuff, researching, whatever. These are all the people that are in, if anything, call it... Um, change development but this other half is where all the change fulfillment has to come from what yeah. happens if all you have in your organization are a bunch of people that live on the in the leader hemisphere the outgrid hemisphere you yeah know? you're absolutely correct because if i map that to ambassador uh top to bottom that whole right side that you just explained is what we're full of in the organization and the left side is what we're we keep lacking or having difficulty attracting right well and it may very well be because the people that are on the right side of this of this uh, little chart we've showing here um tend to view and respect people that are similar to them so if they are involved in the recruiting process, they're just going to bring in more of themselves, um, where you really need to have someone, probably a thinker, um, working with an administrator type who just says, look, this is very procedural. We can't let have people become emotionally involved in the choice of staff. This is a very logical kind of thing. People either have the skills, the knowledge, the experience, or they don't. And if they don't, it doesn't matter how likable they are or how great their ideas are, or how much they share your vision and your passion. I just need people who will show up and do what needs to be done and do it well. So do we want to really have an influencer uh, involved in our recruiting or our, how about final selection process? Well, to a certain degree, you do, T, because you do want to sell the candidate eventually on the job. Yeah. But you're right that, you know, Boris, do you have anybody inside the organization who does this job very well? 
I don't think we have a dedicated person that is doing this uh, recruiting function. Um, we've we've all, I think, at one point or another, referred somebody in, uh, oh. and I'm probably the main person that's doing any kind of selection around this, which okay. is probably the worst thing that could be because I'm that's not my uh, necessarily skill set. Um, but that that's the challenge is we, we found people that are attracted. Uh, to working with us and collaborating, those individuals have tended to be, just tell me what to do and then I'll do it, uh, right. but they never follow through. Poor then, behavioral fits. Right, and then we can't find the people that actually um, will do the actual work. You know, what uh, they call an optimizer ambassador is those individuals, we've been unsuccessful at attracting to the team. Mm -hmm. they, they just don't see the vision you know, for some reason. And if I map it to uh, T's uh, change grid, it looks like that would be the administrator follower type that we're just not successfully attracting. Well, that may be. Um, I'm wondering if it's really about attracting them. I think it sounds like it's about identifying them. Right, because you know, everyone sees the world through their own filter. Don't mind what I'm doing on screen. I'm trying to draw a circle, but I'm trying to draw a circle and talk at the same time. Major mistake. Um, but um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, there's definitely something going on with the recruiting. Like David, you were talking about sometimes you need to be an influencer to position the job as effectively as you can and put it all in its best possible light. Well, how many influencers then uh, go further and talk to someone who is not an appropriate fit for the job. Oh, they do. They oh. do. They certain, there are certainly several common mistakes that people make. The, the thing that you have to be able to do first is identify the specific behaviors that you need to have in the job um, and validate that those behaviors are, are um, uh, going to be effective. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's step number one. Yep, 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 yep. And T, this is a great conversation because I think that this uh, illustrates my earlier point about the value of this particular layer. Mm -hmm. um, and in the in the DE and I space, uh, we refer to this as um, like me bias. Mm -hmm. and, and so what's what sounds like could potentially be happening is, is that even after the selection is made, people are still being evaluated in the like me bias. Um, and so there may not be clarity around role definition uh, and certainly perception of roles uh, from a definition standpoint. Excellent. Yep, yep. Mm. All right, so um, what I'm trying to do with my little circle here is be able to do the next little talk around here. I wanna be able to draw in those circles and I'll figure it out in just two minutes. I need to give you guys something to kind of <clears throat> think about while we're doing this. Um, I would like to put forth the belief that the most effective parents are able to move into each of these roles fluidly based on the situation they find themselves in. And the, the, um, the more fluent they become in it, the tighter they end up being in the center of the change grid. Um, so thoughts about that? I yeah, can say that's for anybody. Yeah, tell the child that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will tell you. Uh, I think you're actually right on because when we looked at the makeup of our organization uh, through the ambassador lens, um, we found that the people that were the most extreme, in your view, out grid or towards the danger zones, uh, those individuals were not our best collaborators. The people that were the best collaborators were the people that are closer to the center. Yeah, interesting, right. Well, that would go, that would be very true. Uh, generally, it's the um, amiable driver or the people that serve the change grid that are the best contributors to those kinds of processes. That's excellent. Um, okay. So I just drew my little circle in. So this would mean that depending on the situation the parent finds themselves in, they need to be able to morph into this. And if I put the other circle in the middle, and I'll 
I'm figuring out how to like scale something. Um, oh, I can do this. Don't mind me. Nerny, 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 nerny. Um, yeah, nerny, nerny, nerny. No, that's not it. Okay, it doesn't matter. Um, anyway, um, I want to talk about this perfectly centered parenting possibility, which would indicate that these people are so good at moving from one of these uh, um, roles into another that for them it's just one seamless almost like personality that yeah. they really are everything all at once mm -hmm. yeah so, and you do end up utilizing all those behaviors as a parent mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know the toughest one to implement is the helper or the uh, uh the follower uh but sometimes you need to let kids lead the way all right, tell us more about that. So that would be, that would put you over here on the follower thing. You're yeah, you know, I mean, sometimes kids will make a suggestion and, uh, or a recommendation or something like that. You might have a different idea, but you let them have the win, you know, let it be their idea, let it be their suggestion. And so mm -hmm. this gives them some sense that they're capable of making better decisions or whatever the case is, yep. so developing some control. Decisions. Right, perfect, 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 perfect. And so I can kind of see that if I'm between the green circle and the red circle, then um, I'm moving in and doing something more deliberate. This is far more intentional to be yep. this far. And um, as I move into this into the side of the green circle, there's less of an intention. There's more of an of an awareness that you're observing. Uh, or interacting with this young human being, and you want to do just the right thing to just the right amount at just the right time, uh, so that they can feel as independent or as um, well in control. You're right, as they could feel. So, um, so what would be the difference between a parent who has a child that is too far in grid? wanting to move them out grid. So if they're going to be out here in a very calculated, deliberate leader role, how is that different than leader inside of the green circle? Hmm. A lot of this depends on how old the child is and what their need is that day. Sometimes you want to encourage them with reward, other times with love and self worth mm -hmm. other times you just want to pick them up by the pants and drag them okay mm -hmm. yeah i think that would be an influencer behavior <laughs> maybe an energizer but i'm sure words are being you asked earlier about whether this is fluid and it's just like with the money types we talk about at, at, at the Co money coaching institute that these all exist within us mm -hmm. it's a matter of which one is beckoned at the time that's mm -hmm. right which one has the most speaking parts or in our case here where is the tension where is the tension where is the mm -hmm. tension and so if you think about um all right how about this you've got a kid that's very far down grid um they're playing their video games they're doing whatever they're a bright kid you know they've got their interests but pretty much they've become a couch potato with a, a device in their hands so uh, let's say for whatever reasons you want them to get out there, get some exercise, get some actual sunlight, get some fresh air, get some real social interaction. Well, which of these roles do you think you would need to um, to to play, hmm. or a combination of them? As the case maybe. You, you know, an interesting factor that no one's thinking about, uh, um, I actually and and my wife end up playing all of these roles with our adult special needs children. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, we still have to be a leader, a follower, an administrator, yep. an advocator, an energizer, an influencer, yep. you know, with them. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> okay, Shags is turning off power. No, you're you're absolutely right. Um, and I think this is the whole point. It's like, is parenting really all that much different than managing people? 
or is parenting just another word we give to being a human development professional? No, um, I don't think it is. You can't fire yeah. a child. Oh, see, I don't have any. So you can't return them? I mean, no, no. You can't, <laughs> can't fire a child. Why, then why do, people, why do people get into this deal anyway? It's, it's a um, lifetime <laughs> sentence. Yeah, I'm just saying, no, no, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It's going to be a lot of things, but, but so, so is the change grid. It's very specific to the situation. And so age is a factor, whatever is a factor. It really is. Um, a little bit more about what am I trying to do at that particular moment in time? So, yeah. All right. So, yeah. um, I what I'm trying to get to is where the where the change grid maneuvers come into play. So, I've got someone who's too far down grid. They're a couch potato. I want to move them up grid, maybe up grid and out grid. So, I think. Um... I was trying to be quiet because I'm actually sitting at the airport here outside. But um, for me, like, you know, the false scare kids that I had, I would become somewhat of the advocate, but then I'm demonstrating to them because they would say something like, oh, I can't do this. Mm. And so I'm the one that demonstrate to them. I was always the athlete of the family anyway. So I would demonstrate to them, you know, and I would take them to the YMCA, get them involved. Now, some of them would just straight check out like the team dynamics things. They just didn't get it. Mm -hmm. And they they had such low interpersonal skills that they didn't connect with other kids. Mm -hmm. But I was the one that said, oh, you know, I, I encouraged them. I demonstrated for them, like, we'll go out and kick the soccer ball outside. And then say, said, yeah, you should join the team. And I'll take them to the YMCA, meet the coach, and they're seeing other kids playing. And that's how I would get them out the, off the couch, at least, to get them interested in something. Now, you know, I had some, like, were interested in, in pets. And so I was always involved in the community. So I'll take them to the local humane society and then they'll volunteer there with the pets. And so building on their interests. So do you recognize, and all of you that are listening to uh, Brian sharing here, do you recognize, or did you hear him move through advocator, leader, influencer? Yeah. Cause he was doing that. So your upgrade, uh, your, one of the things you're employing in order to move a situation upgrade is by changing your perceived role or the, the role you're trying to play. So first you're advocating for something, then you're taking some initiative to demonstrate it or to go, th then you're actually planning to go to a, you know, a location in order for them to be exposed so that they'll end up wanting to do it. And then no doubt you praise them kind of thing. So you moved yourself uh, through these phases and um, assuming they were with you as each movement occurred, they would have moved up grid as well. Hopefully not up to up grid distress, but up grid at least uh, over to where, what you're right. More productive state. Right, exactly. So that's what you, you kind of just did. Now let's dissect what Brian actually shared and the specifics of what he would do. So we know there's four up grid maneuvers. What are the four up grid maneuvers? It's test time, everybody. Change the Change task. task. Change the task. And so Raise the standard. Raise the standard. Yep. Awaken accountability. Boost accountability. Yep, and? Boost accountability. Awaken emotions. emotions. Awaken emotions. There you go. Those are the four. And so I've got someone who's downgrid. Um, uh, my four things I can do are I can increase the standards against which someone is measuring whatever their okayness happens to be. So I'll work with the standards they're using. The second thing that I can do is change the task in some subtle or profound way. Uh, third thing I can do is to awaken the emotions of the uh, desired uh, place on the change grid. Um, and then the fourth thing I can do is boost accountability. So, you know, you get what you measure. Mm -hmm. so, yep. so think about that. So Brian, tell us again how you went about getting someone off the couch. Yeah, I, I did exactly what those change maneuvers were without understanding change maneuvers. <laughs> yeah, so and, by the way, I, 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 and by that's the way, a, a simple thing to do, really. I mean, or, or it was common sense to me to like change the perspective that they're having right now. Because right. otherwise they'll just be tethered to the, the device. 
Right. And so did you do that by asking questions or by offering alternative um, possibilities? Yeah, I had alternative possibilities because otherwise it would be too easy for them behavior. just staying there, right? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So you yeah. advocated for a different thing and then you detected a little bit of openness. Right, right. So then you what? You made a suggestion? Right. No, and the, and, and made a suggestion that, okay, yeah, you, you really love these games. In fact, like I had one kid who will always gets in trouble in school. And when I go to the school, it would seem like every day he's getting in trouble because in his mind, he said, history is boring. I said, you, you probably have a good point, you know, mm -hmm. so I, I'm agreeing with him. You know, not everyone enjoys history. I know we have Kathy on the line here. And, and so I said, but it's, it's, it could be something that, number one, you need to graduate from school eventually. But I said, I have a hard time understanding this because he can read an automobile book from front to from front to back and he knows all the engines and all. so he's reading he's just not involved you know like that subject that, that subject right mm -hmm. and so i re would reward him with these magazines and you know these fancy books and things that he wants to read as long as he can get on in his history i said you know you're not going to do that forever but we do have to get you graduated so, so if he if he's process and outcome oriented show him the process of history Right, exactly, exactly. Go. So and it changes that perspective for him, though, and that's that becomes key. So it's not just like it's, you know, it's an authoritative kind of thing because all the kids that came to my home resisted that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They will all resist that. And how did you handle their resistance? That was the hard part. <laughs> no, <laughs> the rest yeah, was so of, easy. Yeah, oh my goodness! I like. I even remember uh, a couple of them. Uh, <laughs> the ones that I actually adopted, actually, they appreciate it after the fact. But I would end up in court because my car got stolen many a times, and the judge would say, "Hey, you know, these kids deprive you of your personal property. Like, why would you take them back? You know, because otherwise they get sent to a program. They don't." process juveniles as criminals they're considered delinquent and they commit delinquent acts as you continually commit delinquent acts you're assessing points and they'll send you to a program uh -huh. so i will always tell the judge i'm going to take him back because he's he may he's giving up on himself but i'm not ready to give up on him just yet mm -hmm. i said i see something in him and i say that with this guy present, you know, he's in this little orange jumpsuit, but I'm looking directly at him as I'm saying this. So we started to build this relational kind of trust and that helped with that resistance part, but it took, you know, time to get to that. And then, you know, the counseling that we, we went to, it was because, you know, he grew up with all this authority that he just, that were the same hands that dealt him into the system. So he just automatically triggered by resistance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. Interesting. So I heard you move up into influencer behaviors. So that was mm -hmm. yep. very interesting to do. Um, by the way, Brian, I don't know where you are or what equipment you're using, but you sound clearer, sharper, quieter today yes. than any of the calls. So whatever you got in place right now, you just want to duplicate. You, could, do, my... <laughs> you could be producing a recording right now that is really a perfectly yes. good quality. No, it's true. A, now you know what my fancy equipment is? I'm outside on the concourse on my mobile phone with the headset. <laughs> well, it works well. It works very well, very well. Um, okay, so uh, let's think about, uh, uh, you know, the other... Uh, change grid maneuvers. So let's say we've got somebody who's too far up grid. So here you are and they're like, I don't know, crying, feeling out of control. Um, you know, everything is desperate. Obviously there's no real physical harm. You'd be doing a very different intervention if that was the case, if they'd hurt themselves. But um, nevertheless, they are in a physical, emotional state of great upheaval and uh, it's not helping them. So where do you want to move them to? and uh and why well you want to move them down grid center them a little bit more get get them more into rationality okay so how would you do that 
Well, you normalize, simplify, restore, and add resources. There we go. Mm. So we normalize, simplify, restore, and add resources. So those were <laughs> fine. Now, so I think that using upgrade and downgrade maneuvers are pretty um, kind of obvious sorts of things. But let's talk about in-grid and out-grid. Ultimately, where do you want to um, your child to end up on this change grid? So if we said that the, the total of all of your parenting will end up plunking that child someplace on this change grid, where would you hope your parenting put them? To the right. A little bit to the right, a lot to the right. What do we, what do we want? Uh, to a little bit to the right. A little bit to the right. Um, yeah, half, so halfway out. Halfway out. So it's just a pure uh, driver type a balanced leader, a balanced driver, uh, right there. Why would yep. that be your choice? Yep. Yep. Why? Well, because I think that, you know, in, in life, you have to ask for it and you have to, you have to be able to articulate your, your objectives and your goals and your wants and your desires. And you need a little bit of outgrid behavior to be able to do that. Um, and at the same time, while you're articulating that, you obviously need to have enough sensitivity. So that's why they're they're not too far out grid so that they pick up on what others are articulating at the same time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly right. Where exactly is the right. space for um, learning? Like those who would take on like <laughs> um, learning from your experiences, experiential learning, that kind of dynamic. Uh, is that, that something that I'm allowing to be natural or am I deliberately creating experiences to learn from? Where you just like naturally, you're, you're mm -hmm. you know, whether it was through the experience itself, like you, you just kind of say, oh, you know, I, I don't want to do that again. So let me reflect and that kind of thing. Yeah, well, it's interesting that I think we can explore that in multiple ways. If I said to you, as we as we have that everything between the green circle and the red circle represents what? Anyone remember? What is this? All the way around. Where you live life. This is where we live life. This is just life. And I believe that no matter what life hands us, we're going to have an educational experience. So we're going to be learning something about ourselves or others or techniques, approaches, whatever it is. This whole thing to me is about learning. Um, but then you said something else. And that made me think, oh, no, we're talking about the center of the change grid. If, this, if, you, if it is a situation that is not driven by some external factor that's making you live life, but is instead just something that is part of the fiber of your being. Um, that's kind of learning as in absorbing whatever is really happening instead of making something happen so you can absorb it. Got it, sense? got it. Yeah, okay. cause what I, what I was thinking about is, you know, again, I keep looking at all these horrible statistics on adolescence and, um, the Gen Z population being the loneliest uh, demographic right now. And I was thinking about this lack of self-permission, lack of critical thinking skills. But then I'm also thinking about, you know, the attentional faculties that drive our reasoning. So in, in terms of mitigating, well, this has a consequence, this has value, potential value, that kind of thing. Does it fully develop in young people until 25? So I think this, what I'm trying to get to is like where position them to where they give themselves self-permission or learn instead of being influenced by, um, you know, your social media or all this outsourcing of decision-making. Because even my daughter, you know, she was a lot different than these the, the guys that I had, she was into learning from everything. And she seemed like she had this high adaptability for mastery, mm -hmm. but she put herself into positions to learn. But I, again, I had the most difficult time. And some of it could be just because, you know, from the foster care kids, you're coming from neglect, abandonment or abuse, but that's where I was trying to get them to so that we can over, override this resistance and so I was being trained, but yet I'm trying to train them at the same time, you know, with this exactly idea of right. exactly give yourself right. permission, you know, to 
to, to be available. And I used to have to talk with them all the time. You know, I, I don't have anything to do with you being in foster care, but if you at least give me the opportunity, we can learn together and hopefully you'll come out on the other side better than even the parents who dealt you the, the you know, the cards to put you in this system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it took a lot to, to get some of them there because as I said, I legally adopted four of them so they didn't get lost in the system. And they're doing okay now, but some of them were trained by military and they still go through some life experiences that I think, you know, in retrospect, if they had learned this stuff earlier or sooner, perhaps, you know, the, they, they'll be more positioned to take on these things. And so going back to the, the original question, where do you want to move them? Where we, when all is said and done, all of your parenting ended up being one giant result on the change grid. Where would you want your parenting to put your kid? So, David said, you know, mid, middle of, of of the driver quadrant. So, driver. Yes. And what yeah. else? Now, what do you want to add to that, Brian? What else would you want? Yeah, I think something out there. Now that I'm looking at this because with your outgrades you're actually doing things um and you're taking initiative to do it that's right that's right so you're not going to just sit back and blame you know society or blame the parents or blame whomever you're, you're going to take initiative yep 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 well it's interesting i would say that if someone is on a quest for for uh for fortune being a very powerful influencer and leader is probably what those energies would be to make that really come out. When I think of advocators, these are people who are talking about what could have, should have, would have happened. Uh, thinkers have got it all figured out, but don't, don't do anything. And these are all the supportive types. And so I'm thinking this is where wealth is built. You know, it's, it's funny, T, because sometimes uh, even um, uh, introverted people um you know have those qualities mm -hmm. oh yeah so because it's coming this is the the thing you, you kind of wonder about the people that are the very creative types how many of them are actually able to move from that high tech kind of way of doing things up into trying to then build a case for why their new invention should be adopted. And then they become the real leader of making it happen. And that involves being very influential and even energizing. You know, it's still all on this side, but I kind of wonder, okay, so the people who actually built the first Apple computer, was that Wozniak? Yeah, mm -hmm. Wozniak and, and Jobs. Uh, yeah. Um, well, at a certain point in time, Wozniak fell by the wayside. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but I was always just wondering, it's kind of like maybe because the th certain thinkers are perfectly happy here and very valuable here, but they don't want to do this. No, no. Creators, yeah, creators are good. I, I've taken lots of uh, 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 tests and assessments on that. And I'm a creative thinker. And they're great at starting things. Absolutely horrible at finishing. Yep. yep. Absolutely that, horrible. That gets back to what Boris was uh, just talking about when it comes to Bassetter, because Bassetter will also talk about there being several different roles. And as you fill out their profile, it reveals to you whether or not you are X percent this one and X percent that one. So where are you in this big circumplex kind of diagram? sort of thing. Uh, of course, did I say that fairly? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and I, I found it to be pretty accurate from um, the people that I know well that have taken it, and including myself. I'm what they call a generator. I'm very creative, lots of great ideas. I'm not the guy to take it over the line, for sure, just like Brian mm -hmm. said. Uh, I'm not the one that's going to dot the I's and cross the T's. Um, but then we have other people. Uh, some of you probably know Ellen Moran. Um, and, and she's taken the test also and, and uh, given it to the rest of the team. Um, and she's uh, definitely a conceptualizer. And so she fits in that advocator kind of a role. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and so she balances um, that side out. But everybody on our team is on that right side. 
Um, and very few people plotted uh, at all on the left side. The few that did, uh, they weren't ultimately a, a good fit because of that. And, and I think that is the key. You, you need a, a balance. You need somebody else to help take it across the line. Yep. Um, and even if, like I think of my son as a good example. Um, he's not an introvert. He's very extroverted. He's very sharp. But at the same time, um, I view his actions and behaviors as being very much a thinker, advocator type mm -hmm. um, and not a leader influencer, which is where I'd want to see him more um, because I think that he's quite capable of doing it. He just, you know, it's that apathy thing. He just doesn't care to Before do it. So he needs tension management. That's right. what's missing, tension management. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. And I think I said this on one of the calls with a lot of the profiles like, like Bassiter, that maybe one of the things that we need to do is to show that these people on the helping side or the follow through, the fulfillment side, um, are viewed as having much more value than they're currently viewed as having or believe they're viewed as having. So mm -hmm. they don't believe they're very, everyone over on this side thinks that they're super valuable because they're the ones that came up with the idea. They're the ones who put, they're the ones that blah, blah, blah. This is, they all think that they're just the greatest things. Unfortunately, they quickly realize that the that it is these skills, these talents that ultimately bring them whatever the rewards are that they think they also richly deserve. So maybe the reason why we struggle to find and retain these sorts of people is because somehow or another, culturally, we've led them to believe that they are not as valued as they should be and therefore do not receive the level of respect that they should be receiving. And so they gather their goodies and go. And, but really whose fault is that? It's all these people over here who are now suffering because they don't get anything unless these people actually um, are allowed and supported to do what they do best. Did that be yeah, that's a great point. Hmm? Mm -hmm. yeah. That kind of sounds like, um, you know, over the ages, why unions were formed mm. right because, because the, the people workers. all felt like they were doing so much work to create all the wealth at the top of their bosses mm -hmm. or whatever and finally they decided wait a minute if they didn't have me they wouldn't be who they are You're exactly right and that's why you can really take the ceo of any company and if you, you know, it's like you want to say, look, if you were not good in this executive kind of a role, you'd really be screwed because you can't actually create what we sell. You can't, you don't know how to get it distributed. You don't know. I mean, the, they may be able to put it all together, but it's really interesting that they, they tend to not respect the uh, things that they personally lack. I guess is what I'm putting to. So they see these qualities and these qualities are not their nature. And so therefore they are more evolved, more advanced, more valuable. Uh, but ultimately all the value these people would like to realize is dictated by these people doing the work. I think the biggest insight that I just got from what you said was the idea that these individuals on the left side don't see themselves as valuable as they should right. um, and from a recruiting and selection perspective are we getting that message across that we as an organization truly value these types of individuals mm -hmm. yeah. right and that you view where they are where the position they're in as being a a perfectly valuable destination in itself instead of saying like you know mm -hmm. if you do a good job here then we'll move you up into there and we'll turn you put it on the thinker team or the advocator team it's like not only do we not respect you we want to cure you of this disease of being a follower right. <laughs> well yeah, and that, that to me sounds like like counterproductive right it's the old strengths it is. If you want to focus on your strengths i don't want them to move from being where they are if they're really good at that keep doing it <laughs> that's right that's right and even on the on the right side of the diagram you'll find that a lot of companies end up bloated with these kinds of uh, of contributors because they like each other 
and they respect each other and so they tend to favor each other and they make that's what that's what tim was own. talking about that similar to me error right cool. right yeah right, right right and so that's part of the real issue it's uh it's like two different companies i did a lot of work with detroit edison and one of the very first things i learned that i found absolutely fascinating was that an energy company like detroit edison is not one company it's two companies those two companies are energy creation and energy distribution and the distribution is absolutely separate from the creation of it because they realized that distribution is a very left side of our diagram mandate, if you will. Um, and uh, on the right side, it's fine. You want to come up with a new product, a new way, new technologies that will help us do things faster, better, whatever. Great, 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 great. But ultimately, this has to be fully implemented and we need these people. So imagine that at a certain point in time, they said, well, <laughs> it does us no good to generate electricity that just disappears into nothingness if we can't distribute it to someone who can actually use it and get paid for it right mm -hmm. they said yeah we have batteries but you know your municipal government does not have sufficient batteries to power your entire uh, city for longer than what do you want to guess maybe a couple of minutes <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so come on we're not we don't store energy we create it we distribute it so oh uh, yeah anyway um, all right, so we're, we're past our time a little bit. We will pick up on this next week. Uh, but again, I want to make sure we're getting back to the subject of the hand, which is parenting. And so parents as influencers, as leaders, as advocators, developing kids who can be influencers, leaders, advocators. Um, I would like to know where else on the grid you think you are, you want your child to end up <laughs> if you at the end of the uh at the end of the judgment period um where the best parent there was where would your child end up mm. think about that we'll talk again yeah, that's an interesting week. thought because again right. as i said you can't fire your kids you can't i still think you know with enough with the right <laughs> legislation we should be able to do it. You're, you're stuck with them yeah <laughs> even, even then it goes beyond yeah. that well, it is. But that's that's a heart attachment rather than a heart attachment. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. We're under no legal obligation, but uh, yeah. see, none of that was in the brochures that I've read about parenting. None of exactly. No one says it's a <laughs> lifetime sentence. It's like you know. <laughs> it's like they're not they're not being transparent. If they were transparent, then people would kind of go like, "Oh no, these kid things, these junior humans." Mm. I was warned. I was warned by good friends, and I still went through with it got married I, if i had to do it again i over again i would actually just be single with 14 dogs <laughs> <laughs> and on behalf of your children thanks dad <laughs> okay bye for now everybody bye everybody, everybody. Bye. bye bye